So we're going to start with some definitions. We're going to compare a population and a sample. So to start, the population, if you're performing a study, is everyone that you wish your study to generalize to. So if you're doing a study of the grade 10s in your school, the population is the grade 10s. If we want to find out if Canadians like baseball, the population, all of Canada. Now the sample is a specific group of people that you select to represent your population. So if you take the first 20 people you see on the street and ask them if they like baseball, that's your sample and your population is Canada. So there's seven different types of sampling techniques that we can go through. So I'm going to outline them, give a definition, and give an example. So we'll start with the first type, which is a simple random sample. So to form a simple random sample, it just means that every member of the population has to have an equal chance of being selected. So that's all. You could pull names out of a hat, you could do whatever you want, as long as every member of the population has the same chance of being selected. So the next type of sampling technique we have is called a systematic sample. So a systematic sample is when every nth member of a population is selected, where n is any number. So if you have a list of names and pick every 20th person, that's a systematic sample, or every sixth person, systematic sample. So the next type we have is a stratified sample. So a stratified sample is when the population is broken down into specific groups like age or gender, and you compose your sample of the same groups that appear in the population in the same exact proportions. So what that means is, say the population of Canada is 35% women and 65% men, and you're doing a sample of 100. That means you need 35 women and 65 men. So you have the same exact proportions and the same groups. The next type we have is a cluster sample. So that's when you take one of the groups as a whole to represent your entire sample. So it would be the same example we have. It's split into men and women, and we pick all the women and use them to represent Canada. Or another example would be in high school. You take all the grade 10s and use them to represent your entire school. The next type we have is called a voluntary response sample. So with this one, you put out the offer to participate and whoever comes to you is in your study. So that's the voluntary response one. The next one's similar, convenience sample. You, you seek out who you want. So you pick your sample based solely on the criteria that they're available and are willing to perform. So it's different from voluntary. In voluntary, the sample comes to you. In convenience, you seek out them. So an example of a convenience sample would be walking down the street and asking everyone you see, can you participate in my study? or it would be going to your friends that you know have and telling them you have to participate in my study. That's a convenience sample. And the last type is called multi-stage random sampling. So that's when you use different levels. So say we were looking to pick a school to represent Canada. We start by randomly picking a city in Canada and then from the city we randomly pick a district. Then from the district we randomly pick a school. So you have different levels of all random sampling. The next thing we're going to do is talk about bias. So bias means unfairness or when the results are not actually accurate. And specifically when we're talking about samples, bias is when your sample is not representative of the population. So there are three types of bias that can occur. The first one is non-response bias. So that's when a particular group is over or underrepresented in your sample. So say you go to a football game and you're composing a study about whether or not increased funding should be given to sports in your school. If you go to a football game, you're more likely to find people who like sports and would agree with you. So your sample is biased in that it'll underrepresent people who don't like football. The next type we have is response bias. So don't mix the, these two up because they have similar names. Response bias occurs when people lie on the survey. So if you put out a question that says, how much do you weigh? People may be sensitive about it and deliberately lie. Or if you say, have you ever taken illegal drugs? People will not want to answer that honestly. So that's response bias. The third type we have is measurement bias. This occurs when the actual tools you're using in your study are biased in some sort of way. So if you're measuring the time it takes someone to run around a track, 
and the stopwatch you're using consistently runs five seconds faster, that's measurement bias because all your answers are going to be five seconds too fast. Another type of measurement bias are leading and loaded questions. That's where you guide the person who's taking your survey towards a specific answer. So an example of a leading question would be asking what's your favorite movie and then only giving three options. By limiting the answers to three options, you're leading the person taking your survey to answer one of those movies, which would bias your result. Another type of measurement bias is a loaded question. That's when you use specific language to guide your reader to make a specific choice. So let's say the question was whether or not a casino should be open downtown. And you phrase the question, do you believe that this forward-thinking, money-making proposition of opening a casino is a good idea? That type of language guides the reader to make a positive answer to the question and biases the results.